This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Concussions and athletics, and what one of the nation's leading sports medicine institutes is doing to keep players safe. Keeping your head safely in the game on this edition of In Studio. There are movies, documentaries, lawsuits, and plenty of headlines tied to the topic of sports and concussions. From the NFL to NASCAR, head injuries to some of sports' biggest stars have prompted great debate on how to deal with these brain injuries. Concussions are not limited to professional sports, and perhaps more concerning to many is the effect they may be having on those playing youth and high school sports. On this edition of In Studio, we'll examine what is being done to make sports safer for young athletes. Dr. Michael Milligan is director of the Andrews Institute's Sports Concussion Program, as well as being medical director for sports medicine outreach for both Andrews Institute and Baptist Healthcare. He is the team physician for Tate High School. Previously, he was head team physician and director of sports medicine services for Northwestern University Intercollegiate Athletics and Northwestern University Health Services. He has also served as head team physician and medical director at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Kathleen McGraw is sports medicine coordinator for Andrews Institute Sports Medicine Outreach. She has over a decade of experience as a certified athletic and uh, trainer, I should say, and has spent a couple of years as athletic trainer for Tate High School. She holds a master's of science degree in health education and promotion from Oklahoma State University. Her master's thesis focused on factors that affect concussion symptom self-reporting. Brian Humphrey has spent nearly two and a half decades with the Okaloosa County School District. Currently, he is District Athletic Director. He has a bachelor's in physical education and a master's degree in educational leadership from the University of West Florida. Jay Lindsay is the head football coach at Tate High School. For Jay, coaching is the family business. His father was legendary Pace High School coach Mickey Lindsay. Coach Jay Lindsay will be entering his 13th season as a high school football coach. In addition to football, he's also coached high school basketball. Welcome. Thank you all for being with us. Let me begin with you, Dr. Milligan. What exactly is a concussion? Um, it's uh, probably a good place to start tonight. And um, You know, we're talking about sports mm -hmm. concussions. We're talking about a traumatic injury to the brain that affects the function of the brain, the chemical, the electrical function of the brain. Obviously, we're still learning more as a scientific and medical community in regards to what that is, but at, at, at its heart, it's an, it's an injury to how the brain functions. And typically speaking, and, and I'll kind of throw this up to you as well, Kathleen, how does someone get a concussion? I mean, we, we, we think about it just from, you know, being hit in the head or something, but is that, what, what happens to cause the concussion? Sure. Anytime that the brain is moving within the skull, you can have an impact to the skull, you can have even like a whiplash type me me mechanism, excuse me, that uh, creates that motion inside. Um, I've heard the analogy of a, almost like a cake inside of a, a cake container. You're shaking that around, it's, it's jostling, it's hitting the edges, and, and that's kind of oversimplified maybe, but that's essentially kind of what's happening there when the brain sustains a concussion. And, and I guess where I was probably going with that is, I mean, uh, you could, I guess, is it, it is, is it more of a jarring issue than just say a, a sharp hit to the head, so to speak? I mean, does that make sense of what I'm trying to say or ask? Probably probably often it is. There's, there's different types of concussions. We think of concussions in terms of the head injuries with loss of consciousness, you know, the big hard hit and the athlete, uh, gets knocked unconscious or has very obvious symptoms, headache, dizziness, concussion, you know, and the headaches, dizziness, those other symptoms of concussion. But there's also sort of these, what we call subconcussive injuries where they're sustaining blows to the head, well, you know, um, well, in whatever sport it might be, and they may not have any direct symptoms at that time. Um, and, and as Kathleen alluded to, it's not always that direct hit to the head. Sometimes it's more of a hit to the chest and a sort of the whiplash of the head um, shaking and the brain kind of theoretically shaking inside the skull that may be causing the injury. Mm -hmm. Interesting. 
Brian, you, you've been around for a long time involved in athletics. How have you seen things change as far as the way coaches and athletic trainers and athletic directors like yourself approach yeah. high school sports? <clears throat> well, I, I can remember back in even the late 80s, uh, head injuries and concussions were, were, were not even spoken of. If, if, if you came off the field and your ears were ringing, you, you just knew that the ringing was going to go away in a few minutes. Yeah. And you went back out there and played. I think now in 2017, coaches, parents, players are more informed. We're more aware of the, the injuries that are around us and then we're more informed of symptoms. Um, and, and that's one of the biggest movements with the, the Florida High School Athletics Association as far as statewide. Uh, they've got a big push that's come from the legislature that um, um, parents and players have to be informed. There's a, a sheet that they sign off on that they're aware of the injuries and the risks associated with the head injury. Uh, and that's required for, uh, for eligibility. Without that signature and form, that, that student cannot participate in the state of Florida. Jay, you've been around the game for a long time. We were talking offset, and you were basically saying you, you grew up going to football practice with your father as a, as a young child. So you've really seen a lot of that, a lot of evolution in the game oh, over sure. the years. Um, give me your your perception on how things are right now. Uh, you know, I think of course it can always you know room for improvement. Like like Doctor said earlier, we're still learning. You know, there's still studies and the science scientific side still coming out. But as far as you know, the game I'll specifically talk football. I think that the rules that we're going to is trying to make you know the game more safer. I think the helmets are coming out with you know there's there's consistent study you know to 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 try to get that going. You know, like right now we have. For FHSA, there's 30-minute window where you have 30-minute contact period. You know, after that, you know, you can't continue to just do this for two and a half hours at practice. You know, of course, you can have a long practice, but like we were talking the old days where it was, you know, you're not physically tough enough if you just can't continue to hit. Now it's we realize, you know, the the precautions that need to be ta taken during practice and that type of deal. Um, so. And even the rules, there's the, the blindside blocking that, that we see nowadays. You know, back then it was, it was praised upon, and now it's sort of, you know, you're getting kicked out of a game. There's no right. questions asked. You know, you're costing your team. It's selfish, you know, and I think that's a positive way because we're looking after the, the livelihood and the health of the athletes, but it's no longer uh, a standing ovation. Now you just cost the team because that was a selfish act because right. you know better, you can't do that type of stuff. Now you've costed us because we got to get you out. So, you know, the, the, the rules and everything that's gone uh, with that, I think they're making strides, you know. Interesting, you said, um, so you can only have in practice a 30 minute, I, I'll, I'll call it scrimmage? Where sure, you're basically, scrimmage? you know, no. uh, yeah, we, you find ways to break it down and, and honestly, we felt like we've sort of been doing that before, but you know, after two days, like the, we're, we're in our second day of full pads, you know past two days we've we've gotten after it tomorrow we're going to take it light because after two days of of contact that third day you know that was sort of the rule you don't you know you, there's just no reason to continue to do that over and over again so tomorrow will be a light practice where it won't be any contact and that type of deal Kathleen, I know you've been real involved with the high schools and establishing some baseline testing and things of that nature I know Andrews has been uh, very out front on that so explain to me what is that all about? What is baseline testing? Sure, so uh, the concept is neurocognitive testing. You're trying to create a baseline for an athlete, so you're getting an assessment, getting some, some metrics, some data on how they're performing, whether it's vision, balance, reaction time, different cognitive challenges, when they're feeling healthy, no problems, and then hopefully they don't sustain a concussion, but if they do, we can repeat that testing at the proper time and compare that data to their, their baseline. Um, and as you see in the video here, we're actually performing some of the baseline assessments during the summer here. Um, the student athletes kind of being taken through a balance assessment by one of our athletic trainers, kind of counting the number of times she's moving out of that position. Um, the iPad that's strapped to her back there is actually um, kind of tracking and recording her movement there, the postural sway that, that she's creating. Um, so it's that one in particular, there's three different stances on two different surfaces and 
Um, so that's it's actually a best. It's a different elements of it are have been around for quite some time, but the format that we use is just a specific one. We this is our third year of baseline testing with this program called C3 Logics. And some of our um, counties in are still using impact testing. That's another one that's been around for a while. Um, so I think probably not so critical is exactly which type you're using, but you know the, the value there really comes when you have an individual's own baseline score to then compare to post-injury. There's some, some data that's out there that exists for you know what would a 16-year-old typically, how would they on average perform, but right. then you don't know where you fall on that spectrum of, of average, quote-unquote. So that gives us the opportunity to, to compare. So it's valuable. When, when you say impact testing, what, how is that different than what we um, saw It's a right different there? program. It's more computer-based only and okay. versus one we're using that's iPad-based. Okay. Um, so again, I tell everyone, I think um, that's, you're being very proactive. Um, it's been around for a while, but at the high school level in particular, I think it's still growing and emerging to where uh, I, I truly believe, I think it's going to come down to the point where it's mandatory, um, you know, for the different states level. Some states already have that as a mandatory um, thing for their student athletes at the high school level, but uh, it's it's good to have for sure. I think another it's another assessment tool for us. It's not diagnosing. It's not the the guideline there. But Jay, yeah. did you want to piggyback on that? You being involved day to day with it, and you have any thoughts on that? How do you like the idea of them coming out with the baseline testing and doing that? Sure. I mean, it's 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 more of a deal with the parents and the. St I mean, that gives them a leadway. I mean, especially those the the ninth graders. You know, mm -hmm. the the older ones. They're around. Like Kathleen was at Tate before, where they get to know. That, you mm -hmm. know, they get a personal right. relationship. Right. They know right. they're there to take care of them. You right. know, so those kids sort of get a personal relationship with them, and we have full trust in our trainers where, you know, yeah. you go see them, don't tell me anything, just go, you know, and they'll forward it to the coach. But I, I think it's great, you know, for to, to give them where, you know, they stand necessarily, what's tested on, and especially for the young kids that you have coming in, because they just don't have a lot of education, you mm -hmm. know, coming into it as a ninth grader in middle school, and, you know, it's just not talked about. There's not that level, you know, so I really think it's definitely great all the way around, but but the young people mm -hmm. it's, it's phenomenal for, because that gives you know the parents and the just more insight, more information. You know that they wouldn't they wouldn't get. Right. Yeah. Go ahead, Brian. Um, just to piggyback on what Kathleen was talking about, our county, if you're in middle school or high school and you're playing sports, it's required. We we require it for baseline ba testing. Baseline right. testing. Um, so we we're giving it to every athlete now, mm -hmm. sixth grade and up, because we've partnered with the Andrews Institute and, and they came into and tested fourteen hundred of our students. Mm -hmm this summer yeah. in o just in Okaloosa County. And the ones that we, they did not test, we're, we have the impact, which is an online program. But what we've done is we've created a form where it's an informational form for the parents to explain what a concussion is. And then they can either accept to have a baseline test or they have to check uh, that they do not want it and then sign it. But that form has to be filled out. And it, probably countywide, if I'm guessing, and I haven't seen the numbers, I bet there's not 10 to 15 parents in the whole county that check no. Yeah. I mean, why it, would you? It, you right. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. It's, but they can check no, and the kid can still play, but we require yeah. that form. Yeah. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, what I want to know is, is once that baseline is established, then what happens if you suspect the athlete has received a, or sustained a concussion. So fascinating, interesting conversation. We're going to continue here in just a couple of moments when we come back. More on concussions and keeping your head safely in the game. You're watching in studio on WSRE Television. PBS for the Gulf Coast. We're back in just a couple of moments. Unlock your newest member benefit. Over 1,000 episodes of your favorite PBS shows, American Masters, Antiques Roadshow, Nature, Nova, Masterpiece. Watch the best of PBS anytime, anywhere. Become a member, sign in, and start streaming today.
You're watching in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Our guests are Dr. Michael Milligan and Kathleen McGraw from the Andrews Institute for Orthopedic and Sports Medicine. Also, Coach Jay Lindsay, head football coach at Tate High School, and Brian Humphrey, athletic director for Okaloosa County. Our topic, concussions and keeping your head safely in the game. Prior to going to break, we were talking about how you guys are establishing baselines for the young student athletes. And so my question is this, that baseline is established. So if an athlete goes out and you suspect that they have sustained a concussion, what happens next? How does it all start working together? I think the, the emphasis really has to be first and foremost on the education on that front end. So our athletic trainers that we have in our, in our schools, um, the Andrews Institute has high, uh, athletic trainers in uh, high schools in four counties. Um, and I'm positioning those, and obviously many schools across the country and across the state are doing that. So they have those athletic trainers there, as Coach mentioned, know the student athletes and sort of know who they are and they have that trust with, and then the education on the front end. But then um, with athletes, coaches, parents, about what to be on the lookout for. Um, and that's value on many levels. We're seeing, we're seeing athletes now who are looking out for their teammates and saying, mm -hmm. you know, I think you're injured, go get, go get checked out. Really? You know, so that education, mm -hmm. that growth of knowledge is occurring. And then once that happens and that athlete goes to their athletic trainer and begins getting that evaluation, then that's, you know, that's that next piece of, the, piece of it. So evaluating them, knowing them, and making the right assessments. And I'll let Kathleen certainly talk to what they do at the high school. Yeah, sure. We certainly, like Dr. Milligan said, we want to do a thorough evaluation, make sure we're not missing anything else on the scene. But then from there, we've got certain, you know, concussion evaluation criteria that we'll go through. Um, and then, you know, the important thing I like to say, bringing it back to the, the baseline testing, when we're going to use that neurocognitive assessment, it's not necessarily on the field. You know, if they're, if they're symptomatic right then and there, dizziness, headache, nausea, vomiting, any of that, we're not going to stop what we're doing and, and have them start balancing again, you know? Right, right. Um, so where that really comes, the value of that testing comes back in is when they are feeling good, they're asymptomatic, no symptoms, they're self-reporting. And then we can retest them and see if there are any lingering deficits in their vision, uh, you know, accuracy, the responsiveness on reaction tests, um, anything like that, the balancing, how many errors they make and now post-injury versus beforehand when they were feeling good. So, And, and, and that's... Uh and that, that's, uh, you know, that's where we partner the physician, the athletic mm -hmm. trainer, and the evaluation. And we're, we're you know, the, our athletic trainers are well-versed in making sure that there's no signs of sort of the more worrisome injuries. What you don't want to do is miss a neck injury or some other significant right. injury. So they're making those acute evaluations and making sure they're safe to go home under their parents' watch or what have you. And then coming into the clinic to see the physicians to get that evaluation. Um, as they were alluding to earlier with Florida laws, um, every, every athlete who's diagnosed with a concussion has to be seen by a physician and cleared uh, to go back to play. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the most important part is when you suspect that concussion, you know, the rule is when you suspect the concussion, the athlete sits out, you know, until you feel very confident mm -hmm. that they're, um, they're healthy. And most of the time that's going to end up in the hands of your athletic trainer and your physician doing a follow-up evaluation. You know, I thought it was very interesting in him in talking about the fact that fellow players are saying, um, hey, you may have a problem here, we need, you know, to get checked out. When you and I were coming up, that would not have been the case. It would have been, you know, no, toughen up and get back in the game. So, One, one of the things that has happened is our um, FHSAA and our legislature has put um, a requirement that every athlete has to watch a 30-minute concussion video kind of a course that's on the National Federation of High School Sports website. And, and, and educating them there, we're looking at what, they're all watching it together and seeing signs and symptoms and, and the education of it it's so that they can recognize what's happening. If it was happening to them or happening to a teammate, they're all being educated. And, they're, and if they play 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, they're seeing it four years in a row. Okay. So, like I said, the education now is a, a lot better than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Sure. Jay, when you watch a player take a big hit, um, how do you judge whether or not you should bring him in and have him checked out? Because the player might, you know, the competitiveness might be, hey, sure. I want to stay in the game. So how do you make that call? Uh, to be honest, it's a judgment just like anything else. As soon as you see a big hit, my first response is to get him out. 
you know. And as soon as we get them out, once again, the trainers and the, the, they see that, you know. That's why they're there where our kids, because we have built this relationship, and that's what's awesome about what Andrews have done, where they're putting, you know, every day at practice, not even just on a Friday night, but every day at practice, every minute of that practice, there's a trainer on site. From know? Andrews. From Andrews, correct. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there's no more necessarily a player relationship whenever, player coach relationship when that's involved. It, 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 it's a trainer player relationship because I'm not educated. Coaches aren't educated to make that decision, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those deals. Our job is to first and foremost look after the health of, of our student athletes, you know, where if something does happen, I, that is 100% my job to get him out. You know, now as soon as that's out, you know, we get to, to to the people that are more educated to to make that decision. Yep, and that's, I mean, having worked with Coach Lindsay, I mean, it's one of those things, absolutely, we just, it flows on, on a game day it, where, you know, we're ho we hopefully are watching. Sometimes maybe I'm tending to another athlete on the sideline, and they are great. They'll direct them over to me, go see Kathleen, or, hey, Kathleen, come here, Dr. Milligan, whoever, you know, they're going to grab one of us and, and connect us, make sure we, we check that student athlete. Um, and like Dr. Milligan said, if there's any doubt, we're going to hold them out and, and make sure we're erring on the side of caution with that. <clears throat> So. so if you have a situation where a, a, a kid takes takes a big hit, but he says or she says, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, can you look through and say, eh, maybe you're not? I, mean, <laughs> it, uh, it's lots of, I think sometimes. lots of times you can. I mean, yeah. You know, there's always going to be cases where you can't. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's no, there's no perfect test, no perfect evaluation tool yet. Um, but... More times than not, you know, you've stood on the sidelines, you've played the sport as most of us have, and or you've been on the sidelines, and you, you've seen those. When you see the the guy who who is obviously he's down and out for a moment, you know, or he comes off and you can tell, or he looks confused, you know, that that sort of those those people, you're gonna know that, and you're gonna you're gonna pull those people, and you know, there are gonna be those that you see, and you and you bring them off, and you look at them, and you're like, oh, I think you're good, right? And they go back out and play, and then you reevaluate them, which is what we do. Um, and you're going to recognize, oh, they do have something now. You're going to remove those folks, right? So you're going to continue to monitor them mm -hmm. and follow up on them, check them through the game, check them after the game or the practice or what have you. So that's where that continuity of coach, athletic trainer, medical staff all sort of play a key role, I think. And, and I think that's where coaches, that's one thing we do help with is because – we do know our players. Right. I know if something's wrong, you know, if they're not acting right, mm -hmm. something's up, you know. So that's where we can definitely tell the trainer, the doctor, hey, you need to check on such so and so because something's, you know, he's not acting himself because we're around them all the time. We know how they are. When the coach you know? does that, you have a high suspicion yeah. for something. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Is, is there any kind of conditioning that you can do as an athlete to make you less susceptible to a concussion? Mm -hmm. Um, nothing, yeah. I don't think there's anything proven. There's been yeah. suggestion over time about some strengthening with the neck and those things. I think the number one, you're talking about training and preparation. I think mm -hmm. the biggest thing we're seeing when we're talking about football is the heads up program, proper tackling technique, mm -hmm. not leading with the head, those types of things, you know. And I think football has, has really made strides in that regard. Uh, other sports are making changes, you know, with equipment and maybe less heading and practices for soccer or some of those things, some of the collisions at the plate in baseball that are being um, eliminated. Um, and so, you know, I think it's really sort of conditioning in that regard of how we play the games as opposed to how we can bodily prepare. Yeah. Jay, talk about that. How, have you, how do you teach kids to tackle today versus, say, when uh, you're You know, it starts with us. I would say, to be honest, and, and that's where I know if you've ever heard of USA football, they've done a great job. That's the heads up. Um, found uh -huh. the, the technique they're teaching now with the tackle. And it starts really at the youth level. That's where it starts is teaching our, our youth, our kids. But at the high school level, as a high school coach, we have so many kids that's never played football before, you know, until their high school years where it definitely starts with us. It's, it is a proper technique to tackle, you know. It is a proper technique to block. That's up to us to teach it, you know, to be honest with you. Um, and it has changed, you know. You should never use your head 
period right. involved now. I mean, the one that the innovator that we I like to go off of and the new tackle, and it's basically the rugby tackle and style. Pete Carroll sort of created it. That's the Seattle Seahawks. That's all they teach, you know, and that's sort of where we've studied it. And it must be something, right, because he's won a Super Bowl. He's right. won a national championship, <laughs> right. you right. know. And, and the way he teaches tackling, and it's videos everywhere where it's a rugby style. They're teaching, you know, at that level how to tackle like rugby players who do not wear face masks. They do not wear helmets. So there is a proper technique there. You know, mm -hmm. it, it comes down to studying, you know, figuring it out, and at the same time, you know, becoming an expert at it and teaching it um, during, during practice. I heard a professional football players say one time, he said, if you, if you really want to fix or, or, or certainly reduce it, he said, make the helmets a little uh, less protective. He said, what happens in today's world is you've got these big old helmets and walk into any sports, you know, store and pick up a helmet. I mean, they're heavy, you know, and, and he says, you feel invincible inside of that and you feel like you can use your head. You, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean... Uh I would. I tend to disagree because I wouldn't want a broken nose. You know, it right. still does protect that. Your face, the, right? The, the right. face, no, no doubt. Now, as far as leading with the crown of your head, once again, a hundred percent disagree. But that's frowned upon now. That's right. a penalty. That's a, you know, you're 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 kicked out. All that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So, um, I think it is protected. Not sure yeah. you would definitely piggyback I, and know absolutely. a lot more about it than um, me. No, I think it's. It's, that's been a, been a debate, right? Um, we have to remember why helmets became part of the sport, you know, uh, facial injuries, fractures of the face and the skull, and, and those types of injuries were really the reason that helmets got a place in football. And I think that value is still there. What we lost in that transition to the more protective helmets was sort of the protection of the brain. And now that's what we've learned, and that's what we're implementing in, is protecting the brain now by better technique. Um, with that, you know, it, with you know, the interesting caveat to that is you look at boxing, um, in amateur boxing now they're they're looking moving away from headgear, because when they put headgear on, guys were able, to, boxers were able to uh, absorb those blows better, right? And so they were able to take a little bit more of a pounding because they weren't getting the cuts right. and the injuries, and so now they and so they were seeing more brain injury. Right. So now they're actually moving in the other direction. Yeah, and I, and I think that's what this player was yeah. trying to say. It was, you know, that, that it gives you a false sense of security mm -hmm. is basically what he was saying because of these big yeah. heavy-duty helmets. But um, speaking of helmets, uh, helmet technology, uh, I know there's a lot going on right now. So as I understand it, there are actually some helmets out there that they will be able to measure the how hard the hit is. I guess there's some folks who are doing that. Um, there, there's instrumentation that's out there. Um, it's been out there for a while. Um, a lot of universities have been studying this and others. Um, um, and uh, many times it's a device that's attached to the helmet that allows for measuring the impact of the force and the number of impacts. Um, and so, uh, you know, many places have been collecting that data and sort of trying to establish what is sort of normal um, in order to, you know, start making assessments about how we make the game safer. Is there any particular spot on the head that you could get hit on that would make it more likely for you to have a concussion? I don't think so. Um, no. What we have seen, though, is that there's some difference in the kind of the manifestation of those symptoms. So which symptoms start to appear based on where that impact was sustained or the type of mechanism of injury. So we're seeing um, a lot kind of more correlation between certain Areas they're kind of we can kind of group symptoms into certain categories, um, and that there's I think been some connection to the location of impact that sustained the concussion. Yeah, there's both the impact and it's it's that it gets back to that initial conversation we led off the, tonight with with um, how the brain jostles in the right. in, in the helmet as well. So we know that you know you can have and that's the complication of sort of defining a concussion because you can have visual symptoms, you can have hearing symptoms, balance symptoms. Um, you can have issues with your emotions, happiness, sadness. Um, you know, the list sort of is sort of pretty extensive, you know, and, and it all depends on which part of the brain is being affected. Very interesting. 
We will continue this uh, great and informative discussion about concussions in just a couple of moments. Our guests are Dr. Michael Millian and Kathleen McGraw from the Andrews Institute for Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Also, Jay Lindsay, head coach at uh, Tate High School, and Brian Humphrey, athletic director, or director, I should say, for Okaloosa County. Our topic, concussions, prevention, protection, and treatment in youth and high school athletes. You're watching in studio on WSRE Television. PBS for the Gulf Coast, we are back in just a couple of moments. WSRE Public Television and the Escambia Elementary Principals Association congratulate these Shining Star Award recipients. These students were selected upon the basis of good citizenship and adherence to the core values adopted by the Escambia County School System. Equality, responsibility, integrity, respect, honesty, and patriotism. Congratulations to all of these outstanding students. You are watching viewer-supported WSRE-TV, a service of Pensacola State College. Welcome back. This is In Studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. We are discussing concussions and student athletes. Our guests are Jay Lindsay, head football coach at Tate High School, Brian Humphrey, athletic director for Okaloosa County, Kathleen McGraw, and Dr. Michael Milligan from the Andrews Institute for Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. As we were going to break, we were talking about is there a particular hit that may increase your chance for having a concussion? And and you're saying, I guess scientifically speaking, probably probably not. But we were talking off uh, camera there, and you were saying kind of anecdotally, it seems like that pound to the ground. Jay, elaborate on that a little bit with your players. Yeah, it was just, you know, what I can just go back and think of the, the more times that I've seen it as just that force of a kid, you know, going to the ground, whether it's really football, basketball, even a kid jumping up and getting a rebound and legs getting cut out from under him and it's, you know, right. his head straight to the hardwood or football, it's, you know, getting your legs taken out from under you. And I think it's just that, that trauma where there's no separation, it's just, you know, I'm um, a, a straight down and a four straight straight to the to the head. You see that more to me than um, just a straight helmet to helmet um, contact. To be honest, Brian, football gets an awful lot of the attention talking about concussions, but you are the athletic director, so you're looking over all types of sports. What other sports should we be concerned about? Well, with the concussions, um, I know basketball can happen on the, on the hardwood, but I think that there was some numbers out that cheerleading was pretty high on injuries. Yes, it, sure. it, Cheerleading, um, cheerleading has a fairly high incidence. Uh, women's basketball as well. Um, any of the uh, kind of what we call contact sports, um, and so our basketballs, wrestling, um, cheerleading becomes a contact sport often because of just the nature of the um, acrobatics and some of the things they do. Um, so any uh, the lacrosse and, and soccer, all of those sports um, um, have certainly potential risk. I had heard girls soccer was also something that was, for, for some reason, uh, I had seen some research that, that girls soccer seemed to have a higher incidence of concussions than, say, young boys. Is it any, any truth to that or just anecdotal evidence? Uh, there's certainly uh, uh, women's sports, um, women's contact sports, uh, particularly soccer and basketball. Um, we certainly see a fairly high incidence there, um, a bit more, possibly in some instances a little bit higher than the male equivalent. Um, uh, you know, I think probably also, um, I think 
when we look at data, we have to be aware that I think women's sports sort of embraced health and safety a little quicker than the male sports sometimes. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and that may have impact some of the reporting. Um, but uh, certainly those are two sports on the women's side where we do see a relatively high incidence. So I guess my next question is, would it be, is it easier for a girl to get a concussion than for a guy, or does it matter? Um, I don't think it's particularly harder. Um, we do know that women do recover, and females do recover a little slower from concussions on average than their male counterparts for what seem to be equivalent type injuries. Right. Um, so um, there's certainly some sex difference in recovery that we don't fully understand yet. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know that I would say that. Yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I, the stuff I've read has said uh, absolutely the, the females take a little longer to recover, that also than males I tend to have higher initial symptoms. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's hard to necessarily um, kind of piece out how much of it's the reporting aspect, how much of it is... Is there a, an actual gender-based difference, um, sport difference, all those sorts of, it's very multifaceted, I think. I, you know, I tell everyone there, there's no, there's so many themes to concussion, but no two cases are necessarily exactly the same. And it's not, and it's, it's not just, it's not just uh, male-female. We've learned that there's other factors that play into it. And your past history of concussions, mm -hmm. if you've had recent concussions, you tend to be slower to recover. And if you've had past concussions, you're at more risk of getting okay. another concussion. Mm -hmm. That's probably a more important factor often mm -hmm. than male or female sex. But on average, just, mm -hmm. just on average, how long does it take to recover from a concussion? What, so uh, you can say what you're seeing yeah. in your clinic, Absolutely. I guess, right now. Yeah, we've, we've been, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, talking to colleagues, I think they see similar. Um, and, and there's probably some data out there on that. It's probably something we need to look at, probably publishing at some point. But uh, what we're seeing is uh, typically a, a, ninth, a ninth grader um, it's typically going to take somewhere in the two and a half to three and a half week range on average to recover. Wow. Um, as they move 10th and 11th grade, that's where that kind of starts to whittle down a little bit. By the time they're a senior in high school, they tend to be recovering in around, on average around two weeks. Um, and then at the collegiate level, um, typically is somewhere in the 10, 12 day range on average. Um, and so there's certainly as the sort of the body matures, the brain matures, the recovery seems to uh, uh, hasten a bit. And, and you guys were talking about, depending on how many concussions you've had, and of course there's been a lot of publicity about some of the football players in the National Football League and having multiple concussions. Is there a point, in, whether it's with a pro athlete or whether it's with a student, where you say, you know what, you just got to stop. You just, you just really got to stop. I mean, is there is there a number? Um, there's probably not a magic number, mm -hmm. and it, you know, it's a, it has to, at the end of the day, it's got to be a conversation with that athlete, um, their parents, their loved ones, the people that they value, you know, in their decision-making process, and it has to be that healthcare provider, athlete conversation. Um, and so there's no absolute number. Obviously, an athlete who's not sort of returning to full health isn't ready to go back to sports. You know, so regardless of the sport, if they're not back to their norm, they're still having symptoms, then we shouldn't be sending them back out onto the court or the field to participate. Um, in general, rule of thumb and day-to-day -day practice, you know, the, the, the number we look at is three in a, three in a season, three in a year. Okay. Um, and so we begin to see that number, you know, the athlete who has a, a third concussion in a 12-month period, and that's often where... Uh, we're going to be talking to them about taking a break from contact sports, whether, you know, and that break is typically six to 12 months. When you recover from a concussion, um, how does that happen? What do you do? So hypothetically, I get a concussion on Friday night playing football, and let's just say I'm a, I'm a senior, and you know, what do I do to recover? What do I go through? What exercises do I do? Well, we're definitely uh, out of the, the days, I think, of sitting in a dark room and just, you know, be quiet. But there's some, you know, active recovery is kind of, I think, kind of the, one of the words, phrases we're using to describe that now. Trying to keep these individuals as active as they can be within reason. You know, we don't want to make their symptoms worse, anything like that. And of course, this is all under the direction of a physician, uh, you know, working with the athletic trainer. I think that's one of the things that's so great about our setup. We have those pieces in place to, to do that. We can do some of those elements out of the field, really trying to keep those individuals involved in their environment. If they can be out at 
out at practice, be around around their peers. Um, that helps recovery as well. I mean, we're seeing these people who have prolonged recovery, and then you just keep them separated from their sport. That's their passion. That's their that's their their team. And that does not help them recover. So we're really trying to just kind of rework, and, and that's really evolved, I think, over, over the last few years as to this concept of active recovery. And, and then, of course, getting them to where they can go through a return to play program. So it's a graduated return to play once they're asymptomatic, they've repeated their neurocognitive testing, that's cleared. And then they've seen their physician says, yep, we got the green light, we're going to start progressively increasing their activity load to get them back to full. Go. A lot of it's about just allowing the brain the opportunity to heal and recover yep. without another insult, another injury. Um, and, and that's the most important piece at the end of the day. Um, there are some, in, in certain instances, we are implementing some other treatments. We've learned that um, treatment for balance um, and um, what we call the vestibular ocular sy system, the, the ability of the brain to interpret images and utilize that as part of maintaining balance. Um, that system of the brain and um, sensory input where, you know, we, athletes who have those symptoms, we can treat those with physical therapy now um, to help them recover more quickly. And we've learned that athletes who have neck pain after a concussion, that those athletes, if we get those folks into therapy, physical therapy, that can actually help them recover as well. So there's some active components with that. I think the number one thing that's really we've learned, Kathleen's talked about already, is the days of sort of saying sit in your room, turn off all the TVs and everything are gone. We've learned that we need to keep them engaged. We just need to not be sort of adding further insult. You know, allow them to recover at their pace. One of the big stories, um, I guess last year, talking about high profile athletes suffering concussions was, uh, and I mentioned the fact that it happened in the NFL, but also in NASCAR was Dale Earnhardt Jr. I mean, and that was a pretty high profile type event. And I do recall some, reading somewhere along the way, I guess that his, his doctor, neurologist or whatever, had encouraged him to go shopping or something like to a grocery store or something because of the bright lights and the movement and, and all that. So that, is that what you're talking about? That kind of? Um, yeah, it, it's, it's reacclimating into your life. Mm -hmm. um, it's. It's, uh, you know, it's often just those daily activities. Uh, for an athlete, it's often being back on the sideline and watching a practice or sitting in meetings mm -hmm. um, because it keeps them mentally engaged. It, you know, it, it helps stimulate. Actually, it would probably help stimulate the brain's recovery in some ways. Um, but also, it, it keeps them emotionally healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that often got lost early on, I think, when we were in the early days of treating concussions when we started really embracing this was we weren't as a, as a, a healthcare community um, considering the emotional impact on an athlete to pull them away from what they, what they enjoy from their teammates, their, their colleagues, so to speak, their coaches, their family of sorts. Um, and so uh, and that, and maintaining that component actually seems to help recovery. Interesting. We'll continue this fascinating conversation about concussions and athletics in just a couple of moments. We're talking about how to prevent, protect, and treat concussions, especially in young athletes. When we come back, we'll continue the discussion. You're watching In Studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Thanks for hanging out with us. WSRE is celebrating 50 years. Here's a look back to when it all started. Educational television, ETV, produced closed circuit classroom courses from 1963 to 1967. Local teachers auditioned for creating curriculum and teaching grade school and college instructional courses. Mrs. Onita Carpenter became director of ETV in April 1966. Broadcasting 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. into public schools and switching to open circuit for home viewers from 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. Channel 23 began open circuit broadcasts as WSRE, representing Santa Rosa and Escambia counties, on September 11, 1967. Thank you for being part of our past and our future.
You're watching in studio on WSRE Television, PBS for the Gulf Coast. Our guest, Dr. Michael Milligan and Kathleen McGraw from the Andrews Institute for Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Coach Jay Lindsay, head football coach at Tate High School, and Brian Humphrey, athletic director for Okaloosa County. Our topic, concussions and keeping your head safely in the game. Well, awful lot of publicity surrounding concussions these days. One of the things that we hear an awful lot about, particularly uh, tied to the National Football League, is CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Doctor, what is it? Um, yep, that's uh, that's your that's the other good question we need to talk about tonight. So that's uh, CTE is a condition that's been uh, recognized over the last um, decade or more. Um, you know, there was a movie about that, uh, you know, and the uh, research that was done on that, really something that was identified in the brains of uh, former NFL football players. Mm -hmm. um, so at autopsy analysis of the brain and, and, um, and um, under the microscope in the laboratory and seeing that uh, there was plaque buildup and basically damage to the actual tissue of the brain. Um, and obviously over the last few weeks and months, we've heard a lot about this. Over the last few years, we've heard a lot about it. It's certainly an area we're still trying to understand. Um, at this point, it's still something that's really diagnosed after, after death, post-mortem by autopsy. Um, it's uh, been shown to be associated with repetitive head injury. Um, uh, a lot of that's been attached to football, mm -hmm. um, but we've also seen it in other sports. Um, Motorsports and other sports have uh, had athletes who uh, have been shown to have this as well. And so there's certainly a lot to learn there, but there, the, at this point what we have is an association between repetitive head injury or substantial head injury um, and development of this abnormal tissue in the brain that affects how it functions. So uh, as I understand it, a lot of the research right now, um, and, and you being a scientist in, in the medical community clearly understand how this, this works better than I do. But so if uh, there, I, I guess some of the folks who have saying that maybe it's not as problematic as, as the media might have you to believe, they there are insinuating that the, it's skewed, the testing might be skewed because everybody, you know, played football or what. In, in other words, the sample might not be as pure as it could be. Am I asking the question correctly? You know, yeah, you know where I'm is, trying to go with that is, it. That is, that's the question is being answered. The the recent data, if I have the numbers correct, but I think it was 110 out of 111. If I think I think it was the I number. Think you're right, right. Uh, brains were an, an, analyzed, and all of those brains showed evidence of CTE right. at autopsy. Um, the sort of the the other side of that coin that folks are are, are talking about is. Uh, those, uh, that's what we call a um, sample bias, right? So you have people who've elected to have their brains assessed so they were concerned for one reason or another. So um, we don't know what the true incidence is until we look at a broader sample. Right. Um, but, you know, it doesn't take us away from sort of having concern and recognizing that at least there's an association there that we have to be aware of. Um, but from a purely science and statistical standpoint, um, without a sort of a quote-unquote unbiased sample pool, so to speak. It's hard to know um, how that may be influencing the data. Okay. At what age do you believe, and I throw this up to everybody to talk about here, a student or a child, a kid, should start participating in contact sports? Because that's one of the things there, there's an awful lot of discussion about is how old you should be before you play tackle football or, or something along those lines. <coughs> Well, I know in, in my experience, football is not going anywhere. In, in Okaloosa County, we have a full-fledged middle school sports. We have eight teams in Okaloosa County with middle school. So, and, and we play some teams there in Walton. Um, and then we have five high schools. High school football is not going anywhere. College football is not going anywhere. But that doesn't mean that you can't push educationally and teach people the, the risks and the precautions, <clears throat> excuse me, the precautions that can be taken. And so I think that's where the movement is right now is, is, is really push what precautions can you take up front, what should you be aware of during that process, and then what's the process for coming back? Yeah. I mean, you want to jump in, Jay? Uh, I don't know if there's a specific age. Um, that what's, and I'll talk about, of course, my sport, football. What's, what makes football different than a lot of other sports is, you know, baseball. It's hard to play baseball unless you've been playing since you were five or six. You don't see a lot of people that picked up a bat at 15 and wow. they actually make it, you right, know. Right. 
where I have many kids that, that actually end up signing the Division One scholarship and they never played football until their tenth gr their ninth grade year. You you hear about guys making millions of dollars that didn't even play high school football. They were basketball players, and someone got them out. So, you know, I don't really think there's a specific age f with, with football, to be honest with you. I'm a big component where I really do like, you know, for the younger age, I like flag football. It teaches you a lot of uh, movement, you know, learning hand-eye coordination, and it, it, where you don't necessarily have to have that contact at a younger age. Right. You know, that may be not the popular answer for me because I am a coach. But I truly don't believe that, you know, it necessarily there's a certain age that you have to start, you know, at a young age especially. I'm, as long as you're doing something, you know, as long as it's soccer, baseball, you know, but as long as you're active, I don't think as far as, you know, a contact sport, there's a specific age you got to start, to be yeah. honest with you. Well, and, and, and I guess there's been a, a lot of discussion that the, the longer you can delay it, particularly with football, the better off you are because the brain matures. And I know a lot of folks have said you really shouldn't even sure. think about playing tackle football until you get at least a high school. I mean, you, you have any thoughts on that, Kathleen? Would um, there's certainly a factor that the, the brain is still developing and maturing. Um, that's going to continue on into to college even. Um, so that's a factor. I think so much of it, though, is uh, the values of having these young children, adolescents being active is, is critical. I mean, right. having them involved in something, but I think exactly like Brian said, I mean, everything has a risk to it. Sure. Walking down the street has a risk. You can trip and fall and get a concussion walking down the street. So um, I think it, it really drives from that point of making sure that you've got a safe environment for them to participate. You're enforcing good tackling technique, if it's football or, or good technique, regardless of what sport it is. Um, I know I, I have this experience with cheerleading. You know, one of the big things in the, in the cheerleading realm is there was a direct correlation between injury rates and the, the level of expertise of the coaching staff there mm -hmm. you know are they wow. knowledgeable enough to really be teaching that those skills and those sorts of things so I think facets like that are just um, can really create a good environment where it is hard to pinpoint is it the right age I think you got to know your, your own child know your student athlete um, I'm going to give a little shout out for my profession of athletic training I think having a good environment where you have an athletic trainer and involved and around um, and coaching staff that, that listens to them and works with them not against them I think all that kind of Plays a plays a role in that. Brian, how have parents changed over the past, say, decade or so, as more and more information comes out on on head injuries? Well, they're all not the same. Uh, there are some parents who are proactive and, and they they can see the vision. I've heard stories, and, and we've not had any in Okaloosa County, to my knowledge, where. Uh, a kid may have a concussion and the coach pulls him out and the parent wants the kid back in. Mm. I've heard stories of that, but we've not had that happen locally. Jay, what's been your experience with parents? Oh, positive, nothing but, but <laughs> great. <laughs> I'm sorry, I put you on the spot. <laughs> there you go. Um, they want what's best for their kids, yeah. you know, and that's the bottom line. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I hate seeing, and, I, and I've actually seen it, you know, it's, it's, it's starting now, and that's the negative. Um, the, the one thing that I don't like from a media perspective uh, is all it is is being a negative. Mm -hmm. Football is now a, a negative light, and it's none of the positives. You know, it's not what, what, what the game brings to you. It's not the, the, the discipline it teaches you, the hard work. You know the sacrifices you have to make. It's it's all about you know, and, and, and the, the that small percentage of, of what's going on. And of course, we need to to make it better. But that sort of scared some off. I'll be honest with you. Right. And, and and they're looking out for their kids a hundred percent. You know, I I can't never tell a parent. I'll never go there with a parent. That's right. what I'm trying to get at. But um, you know, you have seen it where we actually have had kids where coach they've came in with tears I can't my mom won't let me play you know mm -hmm. my parents and, and 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 I respect that decision you know but at the same time I truly believe um, your passion you know whatever your passion may be and talking with that kid that you know I'm gonna let you chase your dream or your passion because that's something that usually I'm gonna do good at something that I'm passionate about you know where if they want to play football you know you know the risk um, that are involved but there's also a, a lot of good that comes with it at the same time very good. Just a couple of final thoughts. Um, your advice to parents, Brian? Um, well, just educate yourself on 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 the risks and and all the precautions that you can take, and then just be very observant 
and uh, you know the, the 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 biggest story I've heard that's come from concussion thing in the last, and I, I know Doc could probably elaborate a little bit more, is is the second concussion that happens after you've got the first concussion didn't come out. Yeah. So really educate yourself and not get that second one without going through the protocol for return to play. Doctor, about thirty seconds. Um, I think the biggest thing is you know if you're if you're, if, as a parent or someone listening to this, if you have uh, athletes in a school that doesn't have an athletic trainer and doesn't have that support system in place, advocating strongly that your school find a way to put an athletic trainer in that school so you've got that mm -hmm. person there on, on hand to look out for your, your son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter, whoever it might be. 30 seconds, Jake. Sure. I mean, we're doing everything we can possibly do, you know, to educate their kids. And, and like everyone said, just make sure you're educated, you know, look out for the signs and warning. But at the same time, you know, um, we're looking after your, your, your kid, you know, as far as at Tate High School, we're going to have trainers out there. We're going to have a doctor on the sideline. You know, we, we want what's best for them and we're going to take care of them. Kathleen, in 30 seconds, your final thoughts. It's hard to go last. I would, again, the education, working with your athletic trainers, um, don't be scared of it. I mean, I think so many just think, oh, it's just gloom and doom. You get a concussion. It is serious. We want to manage it properly, but that's true with everything. So work with your athletic trainer, work with your, your physicians, and, and see people who are educated in how to manage concussion injuries. Thank you so very much. Good luck with your season. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. And, 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 and good luck on Okaloosa County. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. So, Thank you so very much. Certainly hope you have enjoyed this fascinating and no doubt educational discussion about concussions in youth and high school athletes. By the way, this program will be available online at WSRE.org as well as on YouTube. Please feel free to share it. Our guest has been Dr. Michael Milligan, who holds several titles, including Medical Director of Andrews Institute Sports Medicine Outreach. Kathleen McGraw, Sports Medicine Coordinator for Andrews Institute Sports Medicine Outreach. Jay Lindsay, Head Football Coach at Tate High School. And Brian Humphrey, Okaloosa County Athletic Director. By the way, you can learn more about concussions and other sports medicine related issues at andrewsinstitute.com. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take a wonderful care of yourself and we'll see you soon.